those who are considered worthy of a place in that age. And in that resurrection from the dead, neither Mary nor are given in marriage. Well, I'm getting married next year, which I'm thrilled about, but does make me just a little bit concerned about this text. I will say it's good to be a minister with a sense of humor. Last week, I bought my wedding dress, which I am also very thrilled about. It was fun. I went, I tried it on, and then I went and celebrated with one of my dearest friends. And then the next day, I got to work, and I sat down at my desk, and I opened up the lectionary to see what might be the text to preach on this Sunday, and this is what I got. Those who are considered worthy don't marry. God has some funny timing sometimes. So at face value, I have to be honest, I'm a little uncomfortable with this story. And I'm not the only one, as it turns out. As I did a bit of background reading on this text, it became clear that others have been troubled by Jesus' words. When commentator went so far as to say that no conclusions can be drawn from the passage concerning the character of Christian marriage. None. <laughs> and this response is perhaps not so surprising, given the amount of time and energy that some people of the Christian faith have put into the institution of marriage, enshrining one particular way that that should work, particularly heterosexual marriage. And the last thing that you would want, if you've sort of committed all of that time and effort and money into that, the last thing you would want is for Jesus to maybe contradict that very institution. However, I tend to be of the opinion that when we read something in scripture that we find confusing or troubling or a little uncomfortable, it's probably a good time to explore further. Because it's often when Jesus is doing something or saying something that we still find radical thousands of years later. There's a question at the center of the story. Whose wife will the woman be? And this question is actually one in a series of questions posed by Jesus. Jesus is doing a sort of Q&A at the temple. He's there, people are interacting with him, he's interpreting the scripture for them, and a group of religious elites, the Sadducees, come to him with three questions. They're actually even more kind of like challenges. So first, they ask about Jesus' authority. They say, how do you get the power and the insight to talk about God? And then, they ask about tax. They say, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor? To which Jesus famously responds, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. And then finally comes this question, this question about the woman with the seven husbands. Authority, taxes, resurrection, and marriage. Power, death, sex, and money. Those are some of the most taboo topics even to this day. So it is no wonder that these scriptures might make people a little uncomfortable. Whose wife will the woman be? Frankly, it's an absurd question, right? And the Sadducees, they need it to be an absurd question. Technically, they're asking about this tradition called legal right marriage. It's actually a tradition that you can find in many cultures, both ancient and contemporary. It's designed to keep the family structure intact, to keep the family name going after someone has died. And a really generous reading of this tradition would say that it provides the widow a family and some stability after the death of her husband. However, we should ignore that it tends to be associated with more patriarchal social structures. And certainly the woman in the text, she doesn't have a lot of agency. The Sadducees, they push this question to the extreme. The woman is passed from brother to brother to brother to brother to brother to brother to brother. To brother. That's seven in total. And so even in this hypothetical question, it's clear that the woman doesn't have a lot of power. She doesn't have a lot of choice. She might not even have had the choice 
in that time to choose her marriage the first time around, much less the seventh time. So while the Sadducees, they're technically asking about leave a right marriage, they're actually trying to get at something else. They're really asking Jesus about resurrection, which I have to say is worth asking about. I'm pretty sure we all have had questions about resurrection before, and if not, I invite you to think of some right now and maybe ask me later. We all sort of wonder what might happen after we die, but the Sadducees aren't really interested in a vulnerable conversation about our frail bodies and our mortality. No, to use a southern phrase from my childhood, they're swollen for a fight. The Sadducees, as a group, they don't believe in resurrection. She puts them at odds with the theology of Jesus and some of the other Jewish groups. So the Sadducees are using this question as an attempt to bait or embarrass or shame or anger at Jesus. Whose wife will the woman be? Jesus, which man is she going to belong to? And Jesus answers, you fools. She didn't belong to them in the first place. And I'll admit, I'm paraphrasing Jesus a little bit there. But Jesus, like the good teacher he is, doesn't give a direct response to their question. Instead, he blows the question apart. Because the question presumes a few things. Did you notice it presumes power over? It presumes that this woman is going to always belong someone in life, and in death she is someone's property to be passed along as someone else sees fit. So to paraphrase Jesus again, she didn't belong to them in the first place. <coughs> Perhaps the question is not whose will she be, but who does God say that she is? Because God says that she is her own person. And God says that she is fearfully and wonderfully made. And God says that she is a mago day. And God says that she can be a wife, and that might be a beautiful thing if she wants. But she can also be a deacon like Phoebe, or a prophet like Deborah, or a preacher like Mary. You fools. And then Jesus goes on to say that our God. Nest when 
me hatchets, which was sort of my worst fear as a kid. My mom would leave and never come back. So this baby bird, he, he goes and asks around trying to find his mother. And so he asks a cat, a dog, a hen, a car, and then eventually this big construction tool if they're his mother. And obviously none of them are his mother. So he starts to get really anxious and really scared because he doesn't know where he belongs and he can't find the person who is his sustainer. And so finally, of course, at the end of the book, he's reunited with his mom. He's able to be himself, just a little baby bird, doing baby bird things, being loved by his mom. All is well. He will watch this. He's finally home. And I think that some of us can be like that baby bird sometimes, looking for belonging in places that actually leave us anxious and afraid. Or maybe we feel isolated because we just can't find that place where we fit. We forget who others are, and we forget who we are. We might isolate others because we forget that they're God's beautiful creation, and we might ourselves get lost because we forget that we are God's beautiful creation. I don't think we hear that enough, so I want to say again to all of you, you are God's beautiful creation. Just the way you are. And when we're with God, we belong. When we base our relationships with God, we create space for belonging. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at in the end when he starts to talk about resurrection. He gives a vision of the afterlife that everyone has a place in. He's saying to the Sadducees, marriage doesn't look the same there as it does here. Relationships don't look the same because social divisions and oppressions, they're gone. Suffering, it's gone. Everyone belongs. Everyone is recognized as a child of God. It's beautiful. And the really cool thing is, we don't have to wait for death to experience that resurrection. We can experience a resurrection now by reminding ourselves that we all belong with God. And I know that sounds sort of simple, doesn't sound like a huge, profound thing, but it is hard to really believe it some days, right? There are so many things and people and forces that try to tell us that we are not good enough and try to shape us into someone we don't want to be or that tell us that other people aren't good enough or sometimes that creep inside our minds and we internalize it and we begin to act like we're different from others, like we'll never fit in. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can let resurrection into our lives now. We can resurrect our sense of self. We can resurrect our relationships. We can resurrect our faith. And that is what following Jesus is all about. Recognizing the power that resurrection has in our lives. Recognizing that the way things are is not the way that things will be forever. That things don't have to be this way. And that we can participate in that shift from oppression to liberation, from isolation to belonging. We just had Timuel Black in our space today. He is 100 years old. He is a civil rights icon. And he said that what has inspired him all his life, what gets him up in the morning, is knowing that change will come. And operating out of that optimism every single day. That's resurrection power to me. Knowing that the change can come, that we can be a part of it, and that God wants it for us and for our lives. Recognizing that we're allowed to show up and say, God, I want to try again today. Help me out. So today, I pray that you each feel that promise of resurrection. Whatever might be happening in your life. Whatever parts of your life might feel dark or oppressing or dent. Know that it can be resurrected, that it will be resurrected. Know that God wants all of God's children to have lives that are free and liberating. Wants us to have lives that abide in God, in God's holy and ultimate belonging. Amen. Amen. Amen.